Hey there, everyone. Today we're going to be looking at two essays titled Metallic Assemblages and Materialist Metaphysics from Manuel Dananda's Deleuze, History, and Science. And these two essays are quite helpful in terms of understanding what an assemblage is, as well as causality within an assemblage, um, the difference between intensive and extensive properties, um, the emergence of properties that are imminent in relation to their parts. And I find these essays rather helpful in terms of contextualizing Deleuze's thought in terms of a scientific and historic study. Now, Delanda starts off metallic assemblages by talking about the man-horse-bow assemblage. And this is one that Deleuze and Guattari use in A Thousand Plateaus. And Delanda mentions that one of the key aspects of this assemblage and of assemblages in general is their ability to cut across entirely different realms of reality, the personal, the biological, and the technical. And when looking at assemblages, one of the things that Delanda mentions is that assemblages are always assemblages of assemblages. It's turtles all the way down, so to speak. And our, our frame of reference is really up to, you know, what kind of study do we want to do? How, how micro or macro do we want to get? But we're not really going to get to some fundamental reality that isn't at some point contextualized by another level. So he speaks in terms of these assemblages of assemblages in terms of the man-horse-bow assemblage, for example, or a modern platoon, for example, in militaries. And he writes here on page 68, at any level of such a nested set of assemblages, causality operates in two directions at once the bottom-up effect of the parts on the whole, and the top-down effect of the whole on its parts. On one hand, the properties and capacities of a whole emerge from the causal interactions between its parts. Many human horse-bow assemblages, trained intensively to work together, form a whole with the emergent capacity to take advantage of of spatial features of the battlefield for ambush and surprise, and to exploit temporal features of the battle, such as the fleeting tactical opportunity presented by a temporal break by a temporary break in an enemy's formation. Because of this bottom-up causality, the emergent properties and capacities of a whole are imminent. That is, they are irreducible to its parts, but do not transcend them in the sense that if the parts stop interacting, the whole itself ceases to exist, or becomes a mere aggregation of elements. On the other hand, once a whole emerges, it can exercise its capacities not only to interact with other wholes, as when two enemy armies face each other in battle, but to affect its own parts constraining them and enabling them. And I think this is a really good explanation of how causality works in assemblages. And it's very similar to Graham Harmon talking about undermining versus overmining, which is two ways of explaining what something is. And it basically involves, you know, either going under it or over it, so to speak, uh, in a way that either reduces it or makes it transcendent. But the middle ground here is this imminent causality. And it's one of the most important things in terms of understanding causality in a deleuze guattarian system, is in an assemblage, you know, to take a atom, for example, part of the thing that makes the atom what it is, is certain internal 
properties concerning, for example, energy levels and an electron cloud. So it depends on an interaction of smaller parts that are defining the properties that that atom has. So what the atom is, is of course inseparable from what it does, from how it interacts with other things. And that causality is both bottom-up in terms of the parts bringing about the emergent properties of the atom, which is irreducible to its parts. You can't say that the atom is solely electrons in some aggregate configuration. That's what Delanda is trying to say, is that because of this configuration and because of the relations between different configured parts, you get a whole that is irreducible to those parts, but it's not separate from those parts. It depends on the imminent interaction of the parts. As such, Delanda writes, the existence of bottom-up and top-down forms of causality implies that the evolution of the components of an assemblage at any given level of scale will be partly autonomous and partly influenced by the environment created by the larger assemblage itself. Whether a particular technical object is used as a weapon or as a tool, for example, is in some cases determined by top-down causality. And this top-down causality would be a sort of force of selection. For example, if you're in a military regiment, there's a certain amount of top-down decision-making that goes into the kinds of weapons you use or the formations you make. And as such, there is a dependence of the individual elements of the assemblage to the whole that is the assemblage as such. Now, Delanda looks at a quote that Deleuze and Guattari write when they say that technical objects have no distinctive intrinsic characteristics. And this is a tough quote because Delanda mentions that this has the potential to turn into some sort of Hegelian totality where the parts are subordinate to the whole, where their only value is to add to the ever-increasing totality of the whole. But of course, part of the thing that makes Deleuzean ontology so interesting is it's able to explain the emergence of properties without reducing the individual elements that lead to those properties. And as such, Deleuze can talk about, you know, the molecular components that allow for change. Because even if you think about like a, like a table, for example, it has a fairly stable being on the macro level, but on the micro level, it has atoms in a state of Brownian motion and engaged in all sorts of interactions and tenuously connected to one another, kind of buzzling back and forth. So there's this potential at the molecular level that it seems like that quote would overwrite. But Delanda says we just need to be more specific about what we mean by these intrinsic characteristics. And Delanda distinguishes between properties and capacities. He writes, let's use a knife as an example. Its properties include its length, width, and sharpness. These properties characterize the more or less enduring states of the knife and are therefore always actual. At any one point in time, a knife is either sharp or blunt. A sharp knife, on the other hand, also has capacities, like its capacity to cut. Unlike sharpness, the capacity to cut need not be actual if the knife is not presently cutting something, and may never become actual if the knife is never used. And when a capacity does become actual, it is never as an enduring state, but as a more or less instantaneous event. And he continues that capacities to affect may not be fully enumerated because they depend on a potentially infinite number of capacities. So intrinsic characteristics, insofar as we mean capacities, as in the capacity to do work or the capacity to affect something, that is assemblage relative. It depends on 
you know, the situation in which it is enunciated. And it will always be enunciated in some situation. And, and I'm not solely meaning language. I'm, I'm kind of using a semiotic um, conception of enunciation. But the intrinsic properties of the knife, for example, are not implied to be determined by the assemblage. Delanda writes on page 71, those properties, on the contrary, emerge from the interactions between a knife's own components. The sharpness of its blade between a knife, for example, is a geometric property of the cross-section of its blade, its triangular or pointy form, a property that emerges from a particular arrangement of its component crystals. So we can see that there's a sort of expressivity of the materiality of the knife. Expressivity in terms of it expresses some inherent qualities that make it what it is. And Deleuze is careful to focus more on these intrinsic properties as intensities, which are the result of um, kind of universal maxima and minima that help decide how does something tend to interact in a state, and also, you know, indicative of the tending language of habits, of how do we tend to see something? What is the tendency of such and such object rather than its immutable essence? Because we can change all sorts of material facts about the knife, we can blunt it, but it can still be a knife, it's just a blunt knife. So we can even change the properties about the knife and still retain the knifeness, the hexaity, so to speak, that makes the knife what it is. So the properties themselves, when we get to something that appears to be fundamental and immutable, is actually itself an assemblage phenomenon. Namely, it's the um, particular arrangement of crystals that lead to the physical properties of the knife. So, right, it's turtles all the way down, so to speak. So, the intrinsic characteristics of a thing's capacity is assemblage relative. And then when we look at the properties of a knife, for example, this is not relative to a larger assemblage, but it is the result of a smaller assemblage. Moving into the second essay, Materialist Metaphysics, he starts with Aristotle, who is one of the most enduring realist metaphysicians. And he states rather truthfully that idealists have it easy because ultimately things are kind of set up in advance. The realist has all of their work ahead of them. And Delanda kind of starts by summarizing Aristotle's metaphysics. And he writes on page 82 that Aristotle's world was populated by three categories of entities, genus, species, and individual. Entities belonging to the first two categories subsisted essentially, those belonging to the third one only accidentally. In other words, genus and species those are essential essences, right? Essential and essence share the same root. The individuals, their properties are only accidental emergent. He continues, the genus could be, for example, animal, the species human, and the individual this or that particular person characterized by contingent properties, being white, being musical, being just. A series of subdivisions in which at every step only logically necessary distinctions were made linked a genus and its various species. Starting with the genus animal, for example, we could first subdivide it into two-footed and many-footed types. Then we could subdivide each type into differences of foot, hooves as in horses, or feet as in humans. When this series of subdivisions reached a point at which any further distinctions were accidental, like a foot missing a toe, we arrived at the level of species, the lowest ontological level at which we could speak of an essence or of the very nature of a thing. 
Now, one of the problems that Delanda mentions with Aristotle's genus, species, and individual is that genus and species are seen as pre-existing definitions of what a thing is. And it sort of, you know, it creates a timeless essence of metaphysics that leads to formal causes of existence, right? An essence is what causes that thing to exist, is its essence causes its existence, But the problem is that Delanda doesn't see how we can support this kind of metaphysics in which genus and species are seen as immutable. After talking for a bit about sort of, for example, hydrogen in the way that we talked about as these atoms depending on the properties of the electron shells and the electron cloud and the fact that the properties of the atom as a result are not reducible to the electrons and the various other parts themselves, but rather is imminent and contingent on them. So after talking about that, he says on page 85 that we can summarize this by saying that there is no such thing as hydrogen in general, only a very large population of individual hydrogen atoms defined by properties that emerge from the continuous interaction among individual components. In other words, each hydrogen atom is an individual singularity. To the objection that even if each hydrogen atom is a unique historical entity, all hydrogen atoms are basically the same, they're all defined by a one-proton nucleus, we can answer that there are other components, neutrons, that produce inherent variation. Depending on the number of neutrons a hydrogen nucleus possesses, variant isotopes of this chemical species are generated, protium, deuterium, and tritium. The number of neutrons in a nucleus has very little effect on an atom's chemical properties, but it does affect its physical stability. Some isotopes are stable and more enduring, while others decay faster. When we consider not one atom, but an entire population of atoms, the relative abundances of isotopes, or more exactly the statistical form of the distribution of isotopic variation, contains information about the historical processes that produce the members of the population, processes that replace formal causes in this ontology. In other words, the variation is not a trivial side effect, but a significant source of knowledge and we could add, of being. So, by replacing hydrogen in general with an individual singularity, a variable component of an assemblage, what we get is we figure out what makes something what it is, namely its tendencies to affect other things in such and such a way, and the internal limits of you know, for example, the orientation of electrons in the electron cloud. This defines what the hydrogen atom is, but without either reducing it down to its parts or transcending it up to this general essence that precedes it. Rather, the essence is one with the interactions and tendencies that allow for the hydrogen atom to act in such a way. And by doing this, by moving from the sort of general essences and formal causes of Aristotle to something more particular and contingent and imminent, we get the added benefit of being able to look at variation as ontologically as important as essential properties. So not only is it a matter of what makes something what it is, because, of course, what something is is defined by its actions, it's defined by its functions, what it can do, its capacity to affect. But it's also combined by how it varies, how it changes, how it metamorphoses over time. Because this, too, is going to be responsible for the sort of ways it can interact with other things. And this is the strongest point of the Lozian ontology, is that we get a way to look at reality that focuses on variation and difference as being just as important as essential qualities or properties. 
and a good way to understand the dichotomy between the intrinsic variation in something and the fact that, for example, hydrogen has certain qualities that are common among all hydrogen atoms, even if there is variation in each individual, you know, one might retort, as an Aristotelian might, that these variations are relatively inconsequential, and we can still derive a formal essence that makes the hydrogen atom what it is, that prefigures the hydrogen atoms, these common properties that they all share. But as is usual in Deleuzian works, evolution is a great example of this sort of causality and emergence of essences, so to speak, and functions, really, would be better in a Deleuzian ontology. Delanda writes on page 94, Clearly, the evolutionary conception of species is quite different from the Aristotelian one. The relation between organisms and species is not one of membership in a general category, but one of reproductively interacting parts composing an emergent whole. We could stop right there. It's not based on some general membership in something that precedes the evolutionary process, but rather is equiprimordial, to use a Heideggerian term, with the evolutionary process itself. It's emergent and imminent. He continues, in other words, species are nothing but assemblages of organisms, having the same ontological status, individual singularities, but operating at a larger spatiotemporal scale. A common history in which the ancestors of the organisms that compose a new species faced similar challenges from predators and parasites, scarce resources, and climatic changes is what produces the bodily resemblances that we use to classify them. Shared selection pressures homogenize their gene pool, allowing us to infer that these organisms have more genes in common with each other than with organisms of other species. But as in the case of protons and neutrons, we need to stress not only what stays the same, but also what varies. Without a constant production of genetic differences by accidental mutations or sexual recombinations, selection pressures would have no raw materials to operate on, no low fitness variants to filter out, or high fitness variants to promote. So, this conception of the evolutionary process in a Deleuzian paradigm, which, I mean, it naturally suits itself to, because, I mean, Deleuze is right, and so is evolution, at least on this point. There is a material of change in variable traits, for example. This would be like mutations or adaptations, which can be acted upon by selection pressures. And these selection pressures, the tendencies that act upon an organism that are the result of the environment, are emergent tendencies of the assemblage. And situating an organism in an assemblage allows us to pick out a common history based on common selection pressures, common predators and parasites, common um, environmental events such as, like, uh, I don't know, a fire or some sort of famine or something like this. So what we get here is a really good picture of imminent causality and imminent essences, really. The essence of what makes an individual what it is in an evolutionary paradigm is not separable from the evolutionary history, from the selection pressures actively acting upon it, allowing it to remain in such a state, allowing for certain mutations to get weeded out and others to be promoted. So when we bring this to the human level, we get the ability to talk about what makes a human what they are in a way that takes account of the variation that allows them to be something else. Delanda writes on page 105, Whereas properties fix the identity of a segment, capacities can allow one segment to interact with an entirely different one forming a new assemblage within which that fixed identity may undergo a metamorphosis.
A human body may be definable by a finite set of properties, some extensive, height, weight, others intensive, blood pressure, body temperature. But it is also defined by capacities to perform a potentially infinite set of activities. These include not only productive capacities whose proliferation is attested by the progressive differentiation of labor into many specialties, blacksmiths, carpenters, potters, soldiers, but also by unproductive activities that nevertheless express the body's infinite potential. Jugglers, tightrope walkers, trapeze artists. Both sets of activities insert the human body into an assemblage, an egg, within which deterritorializations and new territorializations take place. So one of the goals of, for example, organisms biologically is to be able encode, to encode the ability to reproduce, to maintain an essence, but also a way to be able to selectively filter and cope with the inherent variation in, for example, the genetic code that's going to result from mutations. So as a result, there's this constant balance in biology between inherent properties and their maintenance and the optimization of capacities. So there's an element of materiality which makes something what it is. And also, there's an element of expressivity. And both of these are assemblage dependent in different ways. But the ability for an organism to be expressive is really what Deleuze is talking about in terms of human interactions. That the ability to look at humans as assemblages allows us to understand both what we are and what we have the potential or capacity to become. So I hope this has been helpful in terms of understanding some of Delanda's takes on Deleuze in terms of elucidating the assemblage and causality and events and all this other stuff. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on Deleuze, Guattari. I've done a lecture on every chapter of Thousand Plateaus. I've done some stuff on Anti-Oedipus and other things. Check out my stuff I've done on other postmodernists, German idealists, gender theorists, other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a monthly private philosophy Zoom that you can tailor to your needs. That's it, and I'll see you in another lecture.